First, I want to say this is a very special subject that's close to my heart. Obviously, I spent over 60 years in the Communist Party. And, uh, you know, this is Valentine's Day. It's something I want to say. <laughs> I love you all. I especially love my wife and my family so much. My, my mother-in-law is out here. And uh, I want to say that turn to the person next to you and tell them that you love them. <laughs> because this whole struggle is really, this is a family affair. You know that, right? All across the country, hug your wife, hug your husband, you know, say hello. And that's good. I know it's been commercialized. This is nothing commercial. You will not have to buy a box of candy from me, honest. Thank you. Um, as I said, this, my heart's full of uh, love and pride for the Communist Party. The more I learn about it, the more I experience it, the more love I have in my heart and confidence and pride in my heart. Because the fight that they have undertaken, they did almost 100 years ago. Next year, you know, our centennial was a great fight that upheld working people and it upheld the rights of women, although we had to grow on that one. But it also upheld the fight against racism and for equality of the African-American people, which was a central question to the whole struggle for socialism. Um, you should know that at the founding of the Communist Party, 1919, that's why next year will be uh, our 100th anniversary, Despite that there were a small number of African Americans who actually um, attended the founding convention. I think I saw a picture one time of it and really you could count them. Um, and that's because at that time, uh, because of the great experience, the great explosion of, of uh, politics around the world with the Soviet uh, revolution and the Russian growth and building of socialism, the first country to do that, free education, medical care for everybody, subsidized housing, uh, and that they removed a very vicious uh, czarist government, which practiced programs against the Jewish people and carried out racial oppression against all of the controlling uh, colonies around them. Uh, so when they won, Everybody uh, who had a sense of justice and freedom and, and believed in a true democracy and socialism and all that were moved. Um, and so that's the people who came here from this country, often escaping poverty and, and oppression and repression, were already drawn towards the, the left movement, but when they were put on the outside in this society, when the Communist Party uh, was formed and so on, they joined it. Um, but it was still a small party in the 1920s, but a very important party as history uh, will show. Now it's very important to note, some people think the communists just uh, happen uh, out of opportunism to embrace the fight for African-American equality. But actually it was deep in their ideology in the basic beliefs of the Communist Party was for the full, total, economic, political, social equality for African-Americans. Despite its composition, for example, um, at the founding, the socialists and the communists split the socialists split from the communists on a critical question, and that is the fight for Afri against racism and for African-American equality. The communists believe it was intricately integrated or a part of the whole fight to change the society to a socialist one. But the socialists believe that it was maybe even a diversion away from that fight and that the black and other people who were oppressed had to wait until after socialism to gain their liberation. So in the great by and by, we would be free. Meantime, they should join them and help them do what they want to do. Now, how are you going to join somebody 
who had segregated meetings, the old socialist party. Debs was great. He got a million votes. But when he held meetings in the South for his presidential campaign that he got a million votes, black people had to sit upstairs. He did not challenge, or they did not challenge, the segregated nature of uh, the Deep South and good part of the country as a whole. So um, there was a big battle on that. And it really was a battle around the strategic approach to how revolution just don't pop in people's head. It really grows out of their experience in resisting oppression. And if it doesn't do that, people go, oh, well, what, what should I do with this then? So I tell you a story of, of Comrade Jim Jackson. James Jackson grew up in Richmond, Virginia. His father was a pharmacist. He went to Howard University. He was he was a registered pharmacist. Uh, and But when he was a teenager, he saw a sign saying there was a meeting of the Socialist Party. And he went out, whoa, I like that. I want to know more about it. By the way, he was the first black Eagle Scout in the whole state of Virginia. You know, came from a, quote, prominent family and all that. Ended up at Howard, as I said. But he went to this meeting, and he was directed into the balcony. So he immediately directed himself out the door. If they don't understand this, is what his feeling. If they can't figure this out, how the hell are they going to get to socialism? And he was right. And the thing that the Communist Party instilled in its members very young, when I came in 61, even though my life experience had given me a certain uh, understanding and, of course, commitment to the fight against racism and equal for equality and harmonize that with socialism, um, that apparently wasn't happening with the socialists. The other strategy, strategic question at the bottom of that is that the Socialist Party in the old days who were allies on many questions with them. We worked together with them. We were all in one party at one point, actually. Our Socialist Party was formed in uh, 1970, uh, 1870, I mean. And so by 1919, people had grown to the point where they sought a necessity for Communist Party. So the Socialist Party were extremely able street agitators. They were the soapbox party. Their form of developing support in the community was to get out there with a soapbox and have put their best speaker up there to talk about the issues of the day. But they weren't on some of the picket lines that were going on. They certainly were not a part in the fight against racism, but even some of the hardcore questions. And when the communists in the 1930s were putting the furniture back, fighting for relief and growing like crazy, by the way, during that period, um, they were still agitating. And as William Z. Foster says, even in the 1930s upsurge, their memberships remained fairly stagnant. I think you can still find the Socialist Labor Party somewhere. They used to have book, uh, we call newsstands and so on. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that it never grew to the proportion uh, of the party nor to uh, the mat bring in masses in, much less black masses. But the party still had a problem. There were three very prominent African Americans who attended the convention. One was uh, the Jamaican uh, poet um, Claude McKay, uh, who um, was part of a group called the African Blood Brotherhood, which was based in Harlem and I think other places, they had about 2,000 members. They were actually an all black movement that was led by Marxists. And the leadership of that movement eventually joined the Communist Party after working with Ben Davis and other people. And um, they in fact uh, ended up um, affiliating officially to the Communist Party of the United States. Um, another one was uh, Harry Haywood. Uh, Harry Haywood um, was a veteran of the First World War. I think he's with the Harlem Hellfighters. I think Harry Haywood may have had a Caribbean background also. Let me tell you, the, the Caribbean, Af the Afro-Caribbeans, they were a great foundation for recruiting uh, African Americans, which they are too, but North Americans into the Communist Party. They were the foundation in a lot of ways. They were the first ones uh, to come our way. Um, 
In addition, a comrade named Otto Hunsward, his last name is H-U-I-S-W-O-U-D, Hunsward, I think it's pronounced. He was actually also from the Caribbean. He was from Suriname. And he was a kind of an export import guy for, to make a living, but he was also a devout Marxist. And he came into the party. I came into the party in 1961. And Otto must have been 97. He was way up in age. He came and greeted our convention. He, he could hardly get his speech out, but he got it out. And he was still the revolutionary Marxist Leninist that uh, he was when back in the old days. That was, and, and therefore, a lot of the people who came from the Caribbean had an anti-imperialist understanding. They had known the national bourgeoisie of their country in some ways. They had a higher sense of class and so on than um, maybe native born did, although native born also were fighting and militant. But the ideas of Marxism seemed to have filtered down to the Caribbean blacks more than here. That's just my guess, but I think that's probably what pretty much uh, happened. Um, so um, the party formed itself on the basis that the African-American equality and liberation was a special question that uh, penetrated the very heart of the fight for socialism, that you could not or should not and it was wrong to tell African-Americans, hold off on the fight against racism. We'll, we'll take care of you later. I would say that was a kind of a racist position. Now, you know, Du Bois was a member of the Socialist Party for a long time, but he left. And when he left, he made very clear that they are white chauvinists. That's the way he put it. Now, that doesn't mean all Socialists are that we can't work with them and they're all bad guys. Certainly today, that is not true. And even back then, all of the initiatives that the party took particularly in the 1930s, which was a great uh, period of growth and influence of the party. Um, the socialists were had some little piece of uh, some of the coalitions that, that we were part of and so forth. For example, the founding of the uh, National Negro Congress. There were all kinds of civil rights organizations before that. Um, the industrial, what was it called? the thing that Patterson headed up, uh, International Workers Defense Organization was one that evolved into something else. They had the Negro Labor, Con National Negro Labor Congress that involved, these were all civil rights organizations. At its height, surprisingly, the National uh, Negro uh, Congress um, actually had more members than the NAACP, you know. And because they entered into the fight around Scottsboro, you know the case of Scottsboro, eight, was it eight? Eight young men riding on a, a rail car, middle of the depression, looking for work. They were impoverished, they were broke, they didn't have a job, that's the way you traveled around, looking for a place. And then they got into a fight with a, a bunch of white guys. And when they were arrested by the police in Scottsboro, Alabama, they were uh, arrested, but then they noticed that there were two white women dressed like boys who were hiding in the same car. And they told, I think that it had to be the sheriff told them, look, you're gonna be considered uh, dirt, dirty or something. You better say that these guys raped you, that they forced you to do it. And they did. And then they, one of them was only 12 years old, Scottsboro. They lined them up. They arrested them, and then they lined them up for a lynching, and thousands of people came. What is the matter with people? Came to see these kids uh, hung, basically lynched officially by the state because the sheriff, well, the sheriff tried to fight them off, but he was by himself. And this is what some historian told me anyway. But when they got on the thing, they lined them all up on the gallows. They were about to hang them. Thousands came into town. They didn't actually get lined up yet, I think. The International uh, Defense Organization that William L. Patterson headed, you know, Pat was uh, one of the early African-American members of the party. Uh, he was not a Caribbean descendant. Uh, and he 
um, led, he was a leader of the International Labor Defense Organization that defended Sacco and Vanzetti. You know that case? Two Italian immigrants who were charged with murder falsely. And uh, they were anarchists fund fundamentally. And they were very vulnerable to the attacks on them. And they were, and they were brought up on charges and faced uh, the life sentence murder. They were charged with murder and they faced uh, uh, life, not life, the death penalty. That's what I'm trying to say. So they were up in Boston and this organization led a terrific fight. And like I say, William L. Patterson, African-American was the leader of the, the defense thing and they made a, put up a gallant fight, but they didn't achieve freedom for them. They were hung. They weren't the first one who were hung in labor struggles and political struggles and so on. So they came down and they basically got a lawyer for the Scottsboro youth and got them to stay any uh, execution or whatever and got them to, they filed some briefs and so forth, installed it. This was a lawyer from the International uh, Workers Defense Organization that the party had built. This was saved them. But the whole story took about 20 years or so for them to win their freedom. And some of them didn't make it. Some of them got in trouble in jail and others were killed. Um, uh, but they won. The case went to the Supreme Court and they won. And the reason today, there is a court decision that people, that black people or people of color should have uh, their peers on the jury. All white juries are not acceptable, should have their peers on the jury. That was one first to the Supreme Court decision around the Scottsboro Youth Communist Party, Communist Party. Um, also, at the time of the founding of the party, I'm jumping around a little bit, lynching was rampant in the country. In some parts of the country, Sunday morning after church was a time when a random black was dragged off the street and they would hang them and so on. Or if the charge of rape, God forbid, was made against an African-American, they were hung and lynched. And lynching, well, you think these special interrogations of the Bush administration, something, this include mutilation, cutting off fingers and toe. I, I don't want to get into it. It was hard. And then burning somebody to death as the final thing. What was it for? Terrify the African-American people. Now you should know that after reconstruction, our people have known terror, maybe more than any people, maybe the Native American Indians worse, maybe. Although, I don't know, the long march and all the others shooting them down and killing them. And, but um, when Reconstruction was collapsing and they pulled the troops out, I've seen figures say 60,000 blacks were murdered or terrorized in that period. And you've heard of Ida B. Wells. She and W.B. Du Bois worked with her and also another person I'll tell you about. But they worked together. But Du Bois was not in the Communist Party. He was still kind of a philosophical socialist, but I don't think he was organized in that group. Ida B. Wells, this outstanding fighter, black woman, uh, who had led this whole struggle against lynching. Sunday morning was lynch. Sunday after church was lynch time. It was that how people thought it was entertainment. You ever see those pictures of somebody being lynched and people standing around can you imagine the dehumanization that it requires to think that's funny or entertainment and so forth? But the still what was maintained and what the party tapped into, they had white members who understood this and was that, that this, this sort of thing was murder and that they believe African Americans were not human, but the party believed they were not only human, but they should be liberated and free and equal to everyone else. 
that's what attracted her. Um, uh, Ossie Davis, who some of you may know, and I had the pleasure of meeting him and Ruby more than once. He actually knew my first name. <laughs> and uh, Ozzy was asked, they were celebrating the centennial of Robeson. And Ozzy was asked, why, why was Robeson attracted to the communist thing? He was great. He was famous. I'm going to talk about him in a minute. And he said, the simplest answer I've ever heard, which to me, it touched me. And I'm just paraphrasing. He said, our people were treated like animals. He said, they are lynching us in the South. They won't give us decent education. In the North, we can't find jobs. We can't get decent housing. Our people are facing police brutality every day and so on. He lit this whole list. The communists said, we will join you in that fight. And it was black and white and brown coming together in that fight. And the consequence of that would mean would gave people an understanding we could win this thing. If we have whites on our side who are understand what's going on and appreciate it, we can win this thing. And so he said, that's why we had no choice, says Asi, but to work with the communists. That's the first time I read. <laughs> he said that in an interview in the Daily News. And he became for all of his life a fellow comrade. He wasn't a comrade, but he was a friend of the party. Him and Ruby, uh, both wonderful people who understood uh, what was at stake. Now, Paul Robeson, whose, pop, whose, whose membership in the party was not public, but I will tell you, some people say they know he was in the party and they know he paid his dues and all that, but he, he it was a decision, a collective decision that he not make it public. That is why People don't notice, but Paul Robeson, or maybe some of you do notice. I know some of y'all here notice. Paul Robeson was the biggest concert performer in the country and all over Europe from 1930 to 1940. He was the best known African American out there. And um, he was a movie star. Y'all know that? He was one of the first black movie stars he did movie. And he was a brilliant athlete. You know, he came out of uh, Rutgers University, 16 gar uh, uh, varsity letters. But on top of that, he's one of the first, they wouldn't let him on the football team. Some of you may have read that story. He went on, he, he tried out, you know, he was six foot four and, and, and quite a physical specimen. He tried out for the team and they tried to deny him, but they couldn't. He was the fastest, strongest, best player they had. So they put him out there, but some of the players decided they were going to hurt him. And there's this whole scene where they tried to injure him. It didn't work. And he went on to break all records at uh, Rutgers University. And he went to law school at Columbia while in, his, in, in during the football season, he was playing professional football. He was a Renaissance man. You know what I'm saying? He spoke 16 different languages, ultimately. He was a brilliant, he's just a brilliant. He spoke, he wrote, he, he, he was Othello. In Shakespeare and theater, everybody knows he was the best Othello there was. And he sang just magnificently. He was a huge, huge, huge figure. So they figure if, if his association with the party is seen as an actual membership, Robeson will face total, uh, total, uh, attacks and isolation and so on, which he faced kind of anyway, but that was a decision. And I know at one uh, hearing he had, they called him down to investigate him uh, to Washington, to one of these uh, anti-communist McCarthy hearings. And <laughs> he gave him hell. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't accept this stuff. He told him what he thought right, right before them. And, the decision at that, but the first time he went down was don't say you're in a party or that you are or you're not. Don't say either way. The second time he went down, he openly said to the committee, my friends always tell me, don't say this to you. He says, I'm not going to answer your question whether I'm in a party, yes or no. I used to say no, but I'm not going to answer yes or no. So he was moving towards a, to a totally different position. The other thing was when he walked out of one of those hearings, 
some smart ass reporter stuck a mic in front of him and said, Mr. Robeson, if you like Russia so much, why don't you move there? <laughs> so he said, my grandfather, my father, no, my father was a slave. My people had given their lives to build this country. You know, the whole thing y'all heard at the first class about how it was the labor of African-Americans that laid the economic foundation for the development of American capitalism. He said, my, uh, my, my, my people have given their lives. We have faced all kinds of humiliation and danger and terror against us and so on. I'm not going here. I'm going to fight for this country and it's going to be mine as much as it is yours. That, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he told the guy. That famous quote. And of course, his other one as an artist, an artist can fight uh, for freedom or oppression. And I have chosen my role. I'm going to fight for freedom. I'm going to fight for on the right side. But there was another one at the when Truman had somehow uh, called him, some committee under Truman had called him down, get the name of it, Dyes Committee or something like that. And uh, when he came out, some smart ass reporter asked him, Hey, um, Mr. Robeson, are you ready? If a, if a lyncher comes up to you, are you ready to turn the other cheek? He said, No, if a lyncher, lyncher comes up to him, I'll tear his head off. <laughs> All I can say is go ahead, Paul. And he meant it. <laughs> um, that was a great Paul Robeson. Jarvis, we're having trouble with the mic. The mic is, is, is uh, giving static. Every time, every time I talk, it's very, it's uh, yeah, it's getting very, it's very. Okay, I'm too so close or something. We should turn it down. Oh, no, something has happened. For some reason, the. Always happens to me. Yeah, well, yeah, well is it still, is making, it still that making that noise, that noise when I talk now? now? Yes, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, is it still, is it still making that noise? That noise? Yeah, for some reason, the mic has become very static, uh, has become ridden with static. So I don't know if uh, if the technician there in New York can do anything. It's getting static, static. When I talk, I talk. Yes, still. Okay, okay. Closer, closer, closer will get more static, I think. Is it better, is it better this way? way? No. That's what, that's what I thought. Well, Steve, Steve is looking at it. Okay. Um, um, should I, should I go, keep going? It's, it's static and it's an echo. Okay, okay. And the only two mics that are open are yours and mine. And when you're speaking, I close mine. So. It may be, is someone there on, on, does someone there have the uh, webinar open online? Okay, P uh, Stevens is going to look, go check on that. I'll wait. If someone there has the webinar open online, they need to close it. Okay. We're going to find out in a minute. It's on the other side of the room. You're fine. It might be. I think it's just me. It's not just me. They're hearing it in New York as well. I mean, sorry. You're, 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 all right. At the Chicago office as well. Huh? Can, can you hear me now? Now it's, talk? Clear. now it's this, clear. That was clear? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Where am I? The significant thing about what I said earlier was that the party started off with very few African Americans, but between the Scottsboro, the whole case, I'm going to talk about Angela Herndon in a minute. Uh, all these cases and all the work that the party was doing, putting people who were evicted back into their homes during the Great Depression, uh, 
uh, hooking people's electricity back up and so on. I have a little family story I want to tell you. I go to my uh, great uh, aunt, who is a wonderful lady, my, 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 my father's sister, who passed. And we had a, she had a beauty shop in Harlem for many years, just like my mother had in Philadelphia. And we went to, the, uh, to her funeral. And uh, it was a very sad thing. But <clears throat> my aunt, who was married to her brother and my uncle, said, man, what's the matter with you? I hear you fooling around with that communism thing. Yeah, and I'm I'm about to give her a lecture, <laughs> give her a lecture, and the patriarch of the family, the guy who had the best job and the most stable income, and who had lived in a five floor walk up when he first came from the south, which and after the war he got a job with the government and he got a pension. And he got you know everybody thought he was like the example for everybody. That he said, no, you don't have to say anything. Listen. That apartment you're living in now, do you know that we were evicted back in the 30s and it was the communists who put us back in there? And he said, um, Ben Davis and the Communist Party were the best friends we had living in Harlem back in the day. And I go, whoa, Uncle Cicero, pretty good. <laughs> but you can't erase it in a lot of ways. Just recently, we tried to get a street named after Ben Davis. And I'll tell you, Ben Davis is in a minute, and that's related to Angela Herndon. And I go to a community meeting, and the people at the community meeting uh, are all kinds of ages, including several white couples who have bought the Browns. You know, Harlem is the brownstone capital of New York now. You can get a brownstone up there, and a lot of people are gentrifying in there, and they still are. Um, and when I uh, started to talk to them about naming the street, he lived on 126th Street after them, which we didn't win, by the way, but we're naming the street after him. The community board on the street said, you ain't got to argue with us about Ben Davis. What y'all going to do? Um, you going to put a statue of him down the street? I said, we can't afford a statue. We're just going to put a plaque and change the name. You ought to put a statue down there for Ben Davis, <laughs> she told me. And when we had a meeting up in Harlem to celebrate Ben, some people went into Sylvia's and tried to put some leaflets on the, on the, on the um, cashier area, you know, when you check out. And the person, what you got there? Let me see. Ben Davis, hand them out in the place here. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is our people. This is, they were revolutionary minded. But at least they, they understood the necessity for big changes in a basic way about the society and not just little stuff or be nice to us or we'll someday when we act nice we'll get a better shot they understood way beyond that and you see it in that vote in alabama still there i'm telling you and it gets stronger and stronger 80 90 percent of african-american voting against extreme right how is that possible so whoa um <clears throat> where should i take this when the uh, um Mussolini government attacked uh, Republic Spain. People know about that. What year was that? 36, something like that? Ethiopian huh? Ethiopian. The Ethiopian was before that, right. That when the Ethiopian was before that, where they dropped tax and, and, and carpet bombed the Ethiopian people. There was a big upsurge in Harlem, and the communists were right in the middle of it. Thousands went out and marched uh, against the fascists and the racism of them and so on. But I'm talking about the fight for Republican Spain, too. People think we were marginal. African Americans were supposed to be marginal. Hundreds of African Americans went to Spain and fought against fascists in the early in the thirties. I think it was the early thirties. I think it's more like the mid thirties. I think. And what was significant? It was the first time, the first time, that black, white, and brown were in the same army unit for the, for this country. First time. Also that there were black officers above white soldiers. First time happened in Spain. And Henry Winston, who was the national chairman of the party years later after 61, he was the head of the Young Communist League then, which had a huge membership. I think at the maximum 40,000 members around the country. And his job was to recruit people to go to Spain. And so a lot of people went to Spain. We had people in the party uh, years 
leader who went to Spain, still around, or had relatives that died or were in Spain. In, in Philadelphia, where I came into the party, there was a guy named Rochester. That was his last name. I don't know his first name. We only knew him as Rochester. And he was a fighter in Spain, African-American, but other African-Americans. Harry Haywood was a commander. Harry Haywood was a commander. He had experience in First World War. So he was a commander uh, in Spain. Uh, over white troops, black troops, all troops. Uh, <clears throat> they were over there. Paul Robeson went there and sung to them right on the street. Louise Patterson went there and did, did uh, support work for them and so on. They were black women nurses. Some of them came right out of Harlem Hospital. We have not been peripheral to this revolutionary movement and will never be peripheral to this revolutionary movement. Already right in the heart of it. And the party had the best understanding. It made mistakes. I don't know anybody who's perfect or political movement is perfect. We made mistakes. But especially when we had the attack for, on the McCarthy period in the 50s and people were panicking. You should know we had just recruited a whole bunch of African, I wasn't there, I'm just saying, African-American new members. And the decision was, we're all going to go to jail. So we, the first thing we should do is drop all the new people for membership. And unfortunately, it, it happened along racial lines. They never rebuilt that either. I mean, never rebuilt it on that level, but it was rebuilt. African-Americans have always been a strong and organized and active uh, fashion. Uh, a group in the Communist Party. In 1934, uh, they took a census of the party, and they had, and, and they had uh, at the eighth convention in Cleveland, they had 24,500 members, 250, uh, 2,000 and, and uh, two and a half thousand, in other words, 2,500 were Negroes, as it says, 5,000 were youth, and 11,000 were members of the young uh, Communist League. But that was in 34. The next convention in 36, the ninth convention, they had 41,000 members of the party. They almost doubled their size. And they had the approach that when you come to, when it comes to a convention, you build it, you organize it, so on. Now I am talked a lot about the Harlem activities, but Ben Davis, <clears throat> who joined the party, he was, uh, the son of a wealthy African-American businessman in Georgia. In fact, if, as you know, the history of the Republican Party was the anti-slavery uh, party and the Democrats were the slavery party. The Repu that was back then. That's kind of changed now. The Republican Party had no distinguished members in Georgia to represent them. And so Ben Davis's father was a representative of the Republican Party in the state of Georgia in the 30s, all right? That meant when Ben was growing up, he wasn't wanting for anything. His family was well off. His father owned a chain of newspapers, black newspapers in the South. Ben Davis uh, experienced uh, the pride in a way of watching his father sitting in his living room and white guys and white people, white politicians will come to his father and get tribute from the National Republican Party. He controlled the treasure of the Republican Party in the state of Georgia. That's the kind of family he came. So um, that's also uh, why he ended up going to Amherst College, very exclusive men's college in Massachusetts, Western Mass, and going to uh, Harvard Law School. Same school that Du Bois went to early. I think Du Bois was the second or first or third uh, African American to graduate from there. Ben graduated with honors, but on top of that, he was a great football player, another big guy from Georgia, and uh, he made he uh, was uh, had a great record as an athlete also. So he goes back. This guy had not experienced the hard sort of um, harsh realities of Jim Crow, like some other people. He came from, as I say, a well-off well family who had establishment links. But he heard about a young black man named Angelo Herndon, who was organized, he was a member of the YCL, Young Communist League, who was organizing in the South black and white farmers uh, and sharecroppers to fight for jobs and and better pay for their for their prop, props their crops, and um, 
Angelo Herndon uh, was leading them on a march for bread or jobs or bread or something like that. It was said jobs or relief or something like that. He was arrested and he was charged with sedition. And he faced the death penalty for organizing blacks and whites to march for that issue of jobs and in poverty and a fair shake on the on for the farmers, the poor farmers, and black and white marched with him in the South. So Ben Davis heard about him and he couldn't get a lawyer. No lawyer would come near him. So Ben, this kind of naive guy, you know, he, he came and offered himself as his lawyer. And he was brilliant. Except the judge kept calling him the N-word and shut up and sit down, you so and so. And Ben could hardly, he wasn't very experienced. He could hardly get his words out that this judge was insulting him. Angela Herndon was convicted, but because Ben had been there to make motions and so forth, and he had assistance from other lawyers, he got a new trial, which actually went up to the Supreme Court and Angela Herndon uh, was free. He got free. So Ben was then, when Ben heard the arguments uh, let me put it this way. At the trial, in order to get Angelo free, he had to fight against anti-communism because they were saying he's from Moscow, he's a conspirator, he wants to overthrow the country, country of violence. And, and Ben, they called in so-called experts, which were party people who were able to talk about what the party was really all about. And Ben said, they said, I kind of think that way. Out of that experience, Ben Davis joined the Communist Party. And he stayed down there. He was a, he was the district organizer of the party in, in Georgia after the after the Herndon affair. I don't know how long he was down there, but he got a call one day after he discussed the situation he faced. And Comrade said, Ben, I think you better go up to New York because it's getting dangerous down there. They were doing things to him, threatening him and so forth. He came to New York. He worked on the Daily Worker for a period of time. He actually, I think he was, he was in the editor of the Daily Worker for a period of time. And then they said, Ben, we want you to go up to Harlem and become the party organizer in Harlem. This is in the 30s. So Ben said, OK, I'm ready. So Ben went up and he led the most successful grassroots party organization in the country by a communist, maybe around the world, because in Dimitrov's report at the Seventh World Congress in 19, was that 35 or 37? 35. When he gave his report, a part of it read it says, we have learned about popular front politics from the example of the Communist Party in the U.S. And he, he started naming things we were doing in the community, and they were examples that came out of Harlem. We were not periphery to this thing. We were right in the middle of this. And so one could argue that rather than uh, us taking orders from the communists, they were taking our example to apply to how to build a broad uh, movement. And in this case, the broad movement was to defeat the fascists, warm up the, the Germans, the Nazis, the uh, Berlin, Rome, uh, Tokyo axis. All right, so this question has had a tremendous impact on revolutionary thinking and so forth uh, over a hundred years that we have been associated with it and before. The Civil War was the longest, bloodiest war in the history of the United States. And what was it over? It was over the existence of the system of slavery. Don't, don't go for that nonsense. It was to you to prevent the secession of the states why were they seceding? They were seceding so that they could have slavery as a system of free labor, which made trillions of dollars for them. Uh, it was the richest people, there were a period when the richest people in the United States were the slave owning uh, forces. They owned more and were very powerful in the Congress. You know, there was this guy, I can't think of his name. Anyway, I don't wanna go into it, but you can, you can look up the history. Uh, there's a one, the wonderful stuff has been written. Um, <clears throat> when World War II came along, the communists organized and thousands of communists went to fight fascists, and especially those who had had the experience in Spain. 
they grew to be um, platoon leaders, lieutenants, captains, and so forth, because they had the most experience with military fighting. Now, there is this thing that <clears throat> early in the war, <clears throat> the Soviet Union signed a pact with, with uh, the Germans because they were not ready for war, and the Germans were. The Germans had been building for war for a long time. Don't invade us. You know, we won't invade you. You don't invade us and so forth. And then, oh, they made such a big that the, that the Soviets were not anti-fascist. <laughs> but who was it that turned the tide of the war ultimately when they got ready and started and militarily had to take on and the fascists invaded the Ukraine and so on? They had, the, the, the USSR lost more casualties than any country. 20 two million died. Somebody said it was even a higher number. They were invaded. Moscow was circled, was uh, surrounded at one point. They were fighting for their lives. People, some of them were hungry and starving. Others were fighting. And they ultimately, especially in a place called Stalingrad, which is now called Volgograd, the um, Soviet resistance not only fought back but held back, almost a small group of them held back um, hundreds, even thousands of Nazi soldiers were trying to take over. All over the world, the radio newspapers were talking about what's going to happen in Stalingrad. And one of the reasons why the U.S. was afraid to go um, into the war in the early stages, but they were hoping that the Russians, I mean, that the Germans would wipe out the Soviet Union and then maybe we can make a deal with the Germans. That was our ruling class. You remember the fight for a second front was to, in fact, the US and others to come in because they were out to crush Eastern Europe and in that way win the war. But the Soviets would help. They got supplies and so forth, but not soldiers were able to turn around the, Nazi, the Nazis in uh, Stalingrad, which even um, Roosevelt, who did some good things, but Roosevelt said that that was a turning point of the war against fascism. So I don't know how you get to a turning point and 22 million did if you didn't want to fight. They obviously did want to fight and they needed to prepare to fight. Uh, so that, that happened. I joined the party in 1961 after the McCarthy period. During the McCarthy period, yeah, I, I don't have time to talk about a lot of it. But there were some special targets among African Americans. Um, there were communists, there were black communists and the, the people who were attacked under the Smith Act. Smith was a arch segregationist, think from Virginia, and his bill actually called the, uh, the Communist Party a spy organization. That's essentially how they they had it, and it, and they called for the communists to. Um, well, they, they, they basically prosecuted them on the basis that they were trying to violently overthrow the government of the United States. And the party said, we are working for a peaceful transition to socialism, which is true. We're still working for a peaceful transition. So that doesn't mean that there won't be a, a fight at some point. The civil rights movement worked for a peaceful transition away from Jim Crow. If you remember, right? they, they were beautiful in their, in their discipline and so forth and so on. And ultimately, they won on a political basis. We are want to win on a political basis, ultimately. So they said that, and they argued that, and eventually went to the Supreme Court, and they won the case. But in the meantime, 10 top leaders of the Communist Party were put into jail. Henry Winston, who later became the national chair in 1961, he had seven years in prison. And while in prison, he developed a tumor on his brain, which impinged on his optical nerves, and he was having excruciating headaches. He's an African-American man, and came from Mississippi, by the way, eventually joined the Hunger March in the 1930s and ended up in a lead top leadership of the party. But Winston was having these excruciating headaches and telling the people in the prison authorities that he's, he can't stand it, pain is unbearable, and they gave him aspirins. But party attorney John App went in and saw the condition that was Winston was in and came out and led a whole movement to free Henry Winston. Free Henry Winston. If we don't get Winnie out of jail, he's not going to survive. And when JFK was elected, 
Don't tell me about bourgeois candidates. I mean, JFK was elected, and JFK accepted that petition that Henry Winston should get pardoned and get out of jail for health reason, and he did. He had already lost much of his sight, only had a little bit of sight left. He took an operation here. He went to the Soviet Union, had another operation. He had some special treatment, and it preserved just a line of sight that he could have, I think really on one eye. But he served from 1960 to well in the 80s as the national chair of the Communist Party. Uh, that was Henry Winston, and he was my mentor. And he was a kind, beautiful man. And I want to read something. And he played a big role in the defense of Angela Davis, which I haven't. See, this is a problem with the time. <laughs> I haven't talked about Angela and how the party really had a great uh, breakthrough on that. Well, maybe I'll just say a little bit. Um, bear with me. Angela's case was about her uh, party membership, and she was teaching in the UCLA in LA. And he and she, Reagan was the governor. He later went to become president. He was a governor then. And Reagan said somebody, somebody, or there was a subversive activities control board, another repressive committee of government that was holding hearings around the country. And they got to L.A. and they held a hearing. And one of the people who was testifying against us was a guy named Bill the Valley, nicest guy you ever want to meet, <laughs> but he was squealing on us, you might say. So Bill the Valley. When he got to go to the hearings and all the students, they went to his dorm room and tied his sheets and just made it life hard. He couldn't, he couldn't stay on the campus anymore. So he said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to tell on somebody. There's a communist working on the campus of UCF professor. And he blew out Angela's name. Well, Reagan had to do something about that, so they fired her. But the Department of Philosophy where she was working raised the money to pay her a salary. Her colleagues raised the money to pay her salary. And she had lectures with over a thousand students coming to hear her lecture on philosophy. So this was a big defeat. But then she was active in defense of the Black Panther Party. You all may have seen the movie. We're going to show the movie here. It's a great, it's a great uh, piece of history. And Angela, who's not in the party anymore, but I think a very good friend of the party. I have a quote from her, I think that says it all. But Angela, uh, her trial ended up with an all white jury. But this wasn't Scottsboro, this was California in 1960s. And that jury ultimately and unanimously acquitted her. So Angela, won her freedom. First, she ran a, a right to bail, which was a broad movement, including NAACP and all these things, which an ally. NAACP was an ally on this and many other questions. And then she actually won that case. But in the meantime, thousands of people joined the Communist Party, particularly African Americans. I can tell you, in a weekend in Chicago, students came from Ohio, Illinois, uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and so forth. 70 African Americans came to hear Henry Winston in a church in, on the south side of Chicago. I made a talk on the youth question, and he made a talk on the fight against racism. That day, we recruited 70 new members to the Communist Party, young, black students, beautiful young people who came into the party. And that was typical. The whole Angela movement had created a whole network of new people coming to the party. It was a great leap uh, in terms of our growth and influence in the African-American community. Let me cut it short now, <laughs> please. Um, first, I'm gonna read Angela on, ben, on uh, Henry Winston. <laughs> This was done, we had a tribute to Henry Winston right in this building on the second floor then. And it was the 100th anniversary uh, tribute to him. This is Angela Davis's speech. Finally, she said, it is important that we honor the life and legacy of Henry Winston, but we must also recognize that Henry Winston was not a great man, was not a great man uh, in spite of being a Marxist Leninist. He became a great man because he was a Marxist Leninist. He was not a great man 
in spite of being a member of the Communist Party. He became a great man because he was a member of the Communist Party. Nothing in his uh, contributions makes sense if you separate uh, from the party and its ideology, if you separate him from the party and, the, and, the, and their ideology. And yet his legacy belongs not just to Marxist Lenin or the Communist Party. His legacy belongs to the African-American people, to the working class and to the oppressed people all across the world who strive for a better society and a better future. That's, she wrote that one after she was not a member of the party anymore, but she, like I said, is a friend and has been and has spoke here many times and so on and remains a principled Marxist Leninist thinker. Uh, finally, um, there's another thing I want to read to you, and then I'll stop for questions because I think I've taken too long. Um, when um, I'm looking for something very important here, oh, here it is. When Ben Davis was working up in Harlem with Adam Clayton Powell, Adam Clayton Powell, who was the first black uh, elected uh, to the Congress of the, uh, the U.S. Congress. When he left to go to Congress, he had a city council seat that he had in Harlem. And he asked Ben Davis, would he lead the committee to find, you know, somebody to run for his seat? And after a couple of weeks, he called Ben and he said, Ben, you know, I've been thinking about it, man. The only guy I know could do this is you. <laughs> and then ran and became the first, uh, well, the, there was Peter Caccione in, in Brooklyn who was a communist and Ben David, they were a team, black and white. And they did some great things in the, in the um, New York City Council. But here's what Adam Clayton Powell said. Today, there is no group in America, including the Christian churches, that practices racial brotherhood one-tenth as much as the Communist Party. That was Adam Clayton Powell saying that. And finally, W.B. Du Bois, the foremost, the father of sociology, foremost scholar in the history of our nation, if you ask me, ain't nothing black, white, I don't care who they are. Du Bois was a giant. He's the one who said the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. So he's the one who said the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. Some people are saying, saying that today. He's the one who said, I believe in the ultimate triumph of some form of socialism the world over. That is common ownership and control of the means of production and equality of, in, of in income. That's him. Um, and then he said something else. Either America will destroy ignorance or ignorance will destroy America. <laughs> You think, you think about that guy we got in the White House? There you go. But finally, let me say this. Martin Luther King gave a great tribute to W.B. Du Bois uh, at his 100th centennial, sponsored by Freedom Ways Magazine. And he made the following point. There's a, there was a lot of intrigue around his speaking because people were scared he'd get red baited if he spoke about Du Bois being a member of the party. Du Bois joined the party in 61, went to Ghana, worked on the Encyclopedia Africana and then died there in 1963, right on the eve of the big march, by the way. He was the father of the modern civil rights movement, W.E.B. Du Bois. But he joined the Communist Party in 1961. And so when King was coming, I know what was going on in our circles. Don't mention the Communist Party. Let, we'll put King in a bad way, blah, 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 blah. And first of all, um, what's the name, the great writer, James Baldwin made a great speech, but he never mentioned the Communist Party, but he said everything but that. I think he got the memo. But somehow, Martin Luther King didn't get the memo because this is what he said. We cannot talk about Dr. Du Bois without recognizing that he was a radical all his life. Some people would like to ignore the fact that he was a communist in his later years. It is worth noting that Abraham Lincoln warmly welcomed the support of Karl Marx, and that's true during the uh, Civil War and corresponded with him freely. In contemporary life, the English speaking world has no difficulties with the fact that Sean O'Casey uh, was a literary giant of the 20th 
20th century and a communist, and that Pablo Neruda in general considered the greatest living poet, though he also served in the Chilean Senate as a communist. It is time to create, to cease rather, muting the fact that W.B. Du Bois was a genius and chose to be a communist. Our irrational, obsessive anti-communism had led us into too many pragmires to be retained as if it were a mode of scientific thinking. That was Dr. Martin Luther King. He was not a comrade. He was a great democratic revolutionary, probably the greatest we've had in this period. And he grew <laughs> after harassment and all kinds of attempts to red bait him, including J. Edgar Hoover calling him the biggest liar in America. Uh, and that's the biggest liar in America calling one of the greatest truth tellers, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, comrades, this pride that I uh, spoke about, it's not a joke. It's not a, you know, just a loyalty. I've seen it. Most of these people I've met, I know. We've had some wonderful leaders, black leaders in the party. There was a time when most of the districts of the party had black chairs, district, ch ch district organizer, and a lot still do today. Even the party is diminished after 1991, but growing back. You know, uh, I forget what the number is, maybe somebody on the phone could tell us, but uh, we are growing by hundreds every month uh, on the internet, people joining on, on the internet. And by the way, if you're not a member, you can certainly become one. But the main point I wanna make is the enemy was so afraid of black people becoming members of the Communist Party that they spent billions to, to do intelligence work in our community. I was a victim of the co in pro -tel program, co in -tel pro program, which was the FBI program to discredit, it started with, with uh, Robeson in Africa, but to discredit the communists and discredit anybody who would associate with the Communist Party. And it had its impact, although, as I said, just like my uncle in that funeral thing, people still appreciate the great strength and power of the Communist Party because we have a record. Now you could say somebody's a phony if they come around and start talking stuff to you for a week. But when you talk stuff for 90 years, you got to start believing it. It's real. People are sincere. Went to the South in the 1920s, communists, and fought and built a sharecroppers movement. They had 12,000 members in the sharecroppers union that the communists built in the South up to the 30s. You had, I mentioned people working in the Southern Negro Youth Congress and the Conference of for Southern Welfare, I think it was called, where the boys was the main um, inspiration of it. I know I'm spinning off on something here, but it's something I want to, I want to tell you all um, about the, the party, and it went right out of my head. So <laughs> maybe we'll take some questions, and I'll you know, think of it later. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, let's let's open the floor for a question. Those of you in New York and in uh, Chicago uh, can ask questions. And those of you online, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, click the picture of the hand, click the picture of the raised hand icon, and uh, that'll let us know you want to ask a question or uh, make a comment, and we'll be able to open your mic. So are there any questions in Chicago, Carrie? Are there any questions? I got some answers. <laughs> Not just yet. Okay. I, um, okay. Edward, your mic is open. Edward? I'm here. Brother, I'd like to say that I, I really appreciate your thoughts and um, really, the, a lot of the notions that you offered here are thought-provoking, and um, I'm just, I'm, my mind is just racing, comprehending so much. 
you know, one of the things, a couple of things that you stated and it got me thinking is that oftentimes I feel that there is an absence of, of knowledge, uh, particularly for African-Americans as it relates to many of the great heroes found right here within a party in a work, whether it's um, folks like James Yates, Oliver Laws, you were talking about uh, Spain early on, um, and some of the other folks that you mentioned here too. I think there should be a particular campaign as we reach out to African Americans in terms of educating them on part of their, their their legacy, their history, and what the party has done, and particularly for folks that many people just don't know about. This is just it's an educational element. I know here in Boston that we are spending some time this month uh, as part of Black History Month, really introducing folks to comrades in a party or close friends to the party and what they've done. So I'm going to chime out here, but I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, first of all, you all know that next year's our centennial for the party. Um, you know, just like in 36 or 34, um, they, create, they uh, recruited 20,000 new members for the next convention in 36. I think we have to look at our centennials that way. And one of the things we need is a special approach to African Americans, Latinos, immigrants, and so forth to join this party. I think it's very, very, very important that we do it. And we have to put our best face forward. And we have to find a way to educate and show people they already know what's going on, but to show them that the party is part and parcel of what can help to move that struggle forward. And uh, that should be a part or certainly be friendly to our party. So I agree with the proposal that we need a campaign to reach out, not just the blacks, but the whites as well. We had a situation back in when I was head of the youth organization, YWLL. And by the way, a lot of YWLL members uh, remain uh, active and, and friendly to the party. Some, when they reached a certain point, went on and made their careers and so forth. I, I don't hold anything against them. And you don't have to be a lifetime communist to make a contribution like a lifetime like me, <laughs> but they're a lot of like me. But at the same time, you're a friend. You got a friend here. Work with us. Be part of us. Help us uh, to do our mission. It's very important. Um, but anyway, I th I'm thinking that um, wonderful, wonderful young people, a lot of African-Americans. I told you about what happened in 1970. You know, some great comrades, uh, like my buddy Tony Montero, he was in, he was in that effort, and uh, we brought a lot of people in Bob Rhodes. We brought a lot of people into the party, and uh, it made us strong. And I think whatever life brings, you can move on. It's a volunteer organization, and to me, moving on, probably you can fight for your principles and do what you think is the right thing to do. Uh, but uh, we are your ally. We're your ally. As long as you're in the struggle doing the right thing, we're your ally. And we should be treated that way. There are a lot of people like that now who are out there, and we're reaching out to them. And the centennial will be a way we'll do it. Okay. Um, Lowell, your mic is open. Brother, I, I, am, I am in awe of your presentation. And... Um, Clearly, we need a part two and three of your words, um, particularly about the African Blood Brotherhood, which I've been reading about. I would love to hear a lot more at um, a different um, webinar about that. And um, you mentioned Angela Davis. I would love to hear about more about that and Charlene Mitchell and other black comrades who serve so with, so, with such devotion in the party. Um, so I would, uh, hopefully we can get to schedule that. Um, you mentioned in the beginning about turning to your neighbor and showing some love. I want to show some love to Dee, who has hosted since I joined all of these webinars and we need to give it up for her. I mean, she's been phenomenal. Yes. And I, I, before I ask my question, I think we definitely have to show her some love and, um, for her devotion to doing these webinars. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So my question, my question after all that, 
you, you kind of touched on it at the end of your speech. Um, this centenary is coming up next year. Um, I am really devoted as a black gay man, and I'm calling you right now from Hawaii, where I've just moved, and I would love to have this party revived here in Hawaii, um, where it was Hawaii. Yes, I'm in Hawaii, and the party was um, destroyed by the FBI in 1956. Right. And we need it. We need it here direly, as we need it across the country. But um, I think it's time for our 100 years to consider. And I'm going to get your feedback on this, because I really want to get more Black and Latinos into this party, um, which has served us for 100 years. Um, it's time for us to get a Black, lesbian, openly communist woman as the head of this party. And this is no disrespect to you or to Dee or to any of the people who are serving this party with such devotion. But I think it's time to do that. And you know who I'm talking about, who we need to draft back into this party to lead this party next year. And would not just be a symbolic, cosmetic thing that would happen, but it would also be a great recruitment to this party for the people that you want and we need to work to build this party. Um, I guess that's the question, do you get your opinion on that? But that's my statement. Um, so I want your feedback. Thank you, and thank you, Dee. Thank you very much, Dee. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as I told Angela, Angela I think, it, uh, you know, whenever you're ready to come back in, come on back in. And, and she is material for national leadership. Although we have a good national leadership of the party now, and they're doing good work, and they're trying to bring the party up and uh, rebuild from '91 setback, and I think we are are rebuilding, and we appreciate uh, all of our comrades in top leadership, and um, they're mature enough to hear disagreement and respond to it. So John Bechtel, Joe Sims, all of them. By the way, Joe Sims. Uh, wrote a wonderful pamphlet on why African-Americans should join the Communist Party. That's an old one, and I hear they're renewing it now, and I hope I hope we'll uh, get it together. It's not easy uh, to do this stuff. It really isn't, you know? And uh, it's hard for people to see themselves taking on that full-time thing. But the door is open. Come on in, you become a part of it. And I think, um, the measure of your contribution will be the measure of how high you can go we go in the party you know so anyway but thanks for your remarks and when are we coming to hawaii i'm joking <laughs> well nice time of year to be there is there a question in in new york from the audience yeah i have a question the role of the communist party in breaking cultural bonds in baseball the role of the Communist Party in breaking the color bar in baseball. Thanks for raising that, Bernie. I appreciate that. It was a great thing. Um, I'll get you next because we got two questions here. Just on that, I think it's really important people to know that, you know, the Negro League was there for a reason because they wouldn't let them into the regular league. And there were some really fabulous players in the Negro League of baseball. But they had a rough life and they didn't make much money and they didn't get much fame. And um, so the sports reporter for the Daily Worker was the first to wage a campaign to integrate professional football, uh, baseball, football is another one, but professional baseball. And um, he led a crusade. People went to the games with signs. War trade unions endorsed the idea. Union members came and stood up and expressed their point of view, showing their signs about the need to integrate baseball. Branch Rickey, being a wise man, ultimately agreed to do it. But he wouldn't have done it. What Paul Robeson and William L. Patterson went to visit him, actually sat down with him and talked to him about the need to integrate baseball. And then he said, well, we've got to find a, a Negro who is acceptable and all of that. And they chose Jackie Robinson, who came from California, college kid, smart, and a terrific player, terrific player. And he was the first to go on the Dodgers. And the rest is history. But it actually was the communist, the Young Communist League, and the Communist Party, and the Communist Press that led that fight to integrate baseball. Ben Davis, ben Davis and, and Pete Cacciomo, they were in city council then. Right. Right. No, thanks for that. 
One more question back there. The static has begun again. Oh boy, oh boy. Steven, Steven thing has a network. Because I think I think it's because maybe maybe, maybe hour. the hour. This, this, no, no. Um I I think someone in the audience has has the has the program open either on their phone or on a computer. And they have it. Anybody have that? Because you're getting a little echo or something. We're getting static and we're getting an echo. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, the question, well, the question so I can't so tell I you can't what the question, question, question. I don't know if you heard, you heard it. Heard the question, question. Yeah, yeah. Testing, one, one, two, three, three, still doing it, doing it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's working on it. Yeah, still the same. No, it's perfect. What did you say? It's perfect. It's perfect. Oh, good. So um, the comrade here was asking um, about black history should be used as a way to mobilize um, the current political situation we have now in the day. Is that kind of what you were saying? Or am I got it wrong? Oh, school curriculum. You know, they have it in a lot of schools, but it's so shallow. You know, this one did this, that one did this. Never about the oppression and the struggle. We got a history of struggle. That is the main part about it, that we were confronted with this horrible condition and we fought to change it and did change it, even though the fight continues. That is not given proper consideration. She's talking about in, in the Caribbean, uh, they have books and literature about the whole history of South America, the Caribbean, uh, and the whole 
uh, the existence of African American people. African -Amer by the way, there are more African Americans outside of America than in. You know that, right? <laughs> it goes all the way down to Brazil. I just want to say one, one, one thing, though. The role of the Caribbean, uh, people from the Caribbean to our struggle, invaluable. You know that the most, the strongest, how should I put it, the African American who had the highest position in the labor movement back in the 40s and 50s was a guy named Ferdinand Smith. That's him right there, that handsome dude. See? Jamaican. He headed the National Maritime Union. He was the highest black in the nation in the labor movement. That guy right there, Ferdinand Smith, Jamaican. Claudia Jones, great leader of our party, also Jamaican. No, I think she's from Trinidad. Trinidad. That's that woman right there. So there, there's a great Taylor. Huh? Taylor. Like a Bill Taylor, I think, is the corner. Bill Taylor, you're right. It's from he was from Nevis. He's from Nevis. Buddy of mine. Where's where's the picture of Bill? Oh, okay. Hi. We had it, my buddy. What is this? <laughs> Bill Day, yeah. Bill uh, Taylor, my buddy. Anyway, he was the chairman of the party in Southern California, and as and when he reached an advanced age, his wife passed. He came to move to New York, and he was part of the national leadership. He was from Nevis, and he has a sister who was the first federal black woman federal judge, Constant Motley. Uh, that was his. Yeah, that was his sister. Yeah. All if right. we could, if we could take one more question, yeah. uh, there's a question from the audience in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. John, you hear me? Shelby. Hey, Shelby, how you doing? Hey, great, great, great. Very uh, education. Um, my question is around um, heroes uh, of the party, those that you named. Um, no doubt about them, giants. Um, I mean, such a giant sometimes is intimidating. Um, in our efforts in, in recruiting people out here on on uh, on in the streets, um, we tell those stories and it's appreciated. But sometimes I wonder if people conclude, well, these these were really such giants of such uh, magnitude and such brilliance. But I, I kind of think of, um, I remember when I first came to the party, one person who I was kind of um, intrigued about having studied but should more is Hosea um, Hudson. Hosea Hudson, which I would also say is a, a, a hero of the party and type of hero that, that there are a lot of people out there who can relate to. And here in Chicago, we have uh, Frank Rumpkin, who I actually saw uh, uh, in, 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 in life and was amazed at how he related to men, uh, industrial workers, in ways that intellectual workers couldn't connect with, as far as I'm concerned. That's what impressed me about him as I would watch and, 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 and study how he dealt with, uh, with with working people, working class. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shelby. Let me just say, the Chicago has produced more outstanding communist leaders, maybe than any other place around. In a lot of ways, basic working class people. Um, Frank Lumpkin, you mentioned, but Frank, uh, who led that whole fight uh, for Wisconsin Steel, always bring a crowd. Him and B always made a tremendous contribution. Uh, Pat Ellis, Al Ellis, Ishmael Flory, one of my old buddies, makes great uh, grits and eggs. <laughs> there are many grits and eggs with Ish, who uh, had a base uh, and was a great distributor to paper and a great leader on the south side of Chicago. So many, Claude Lightfoot. Actually, Claude and I were bunkmates for a long time in, uh, when he lived in uh, Brooklyn. Um, so, you know, all I can say is that we have a rich history. We got to figure out how to put it out there and get it out there. It's a winner. I'm telling you, it is a winner. And for too long, we've let the bad guys distort 
what is going on. No communists will use you and all everything. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, there were always some communists who weren't always that great at dealing with people. I've got to be honest with you. But the overall experience of people of color in the party was a great one. And they contributed and the party contributed to them. So I think that's the last question. D. Yeah, we're going to sign off uh, online and we uh, express our uh, appreciation for your uh, uh, being with us tonight. And uh, as uh, was indicated, we have a lot to learn, a lot more stories to hear, and we look forward to the opportunities to do so. So thank, thank you. you and good night. Thank you.